This is the story of the man behind the most remarkable discovery. His breakthrough seemed so revolutionary, it could have created an extraordinary new world. A world where disease could be destroyed before the first symptoms appear. Where nothing would be beyond the boundaries of human knowledge. But others thought it could also be a world where the darkest evil could be unleashed. Where microscopic machines would link up to destroy us all. It could solve all of our technology problems and give us a techno-utopia, or it could wipe us out and cause complete extinction. We really have to think very carefully before we go down that sort of a road. This amazing world could have been brought a step closer by the brilliant mind of Jan Hendrik Schun. What Hendrik had reported was just so amazing that uh, we used to joke at lunch that either he's going to Stockholm to pick up that Nobel Prize or he's going to jail. This is the astonishing story of Jan Hendrik Schun and his discovery that could have changed everything. of reckoning has come and gone. Most of life has literally been devoured by something called nanotechnology. Tiny machines that were designed to save the human race, but instead, they turned on us. Human life has been wiped out by the nanobot. The size of nanobots are hard for most people to imagine because we're, we're talking about instruments that are designed literally atom by atom and molecule by molecule. So they're below what you can see. If you can think of a speck of dust, that would be a very large nanobot. Nanobots were created to be like life. to be able to reproduce, to serve our needs. The intelligence of nanotechnology will not be in one nanorobot or nanobot. It will be a collective intelligence of millions, of, actually trillions of nanobots working together and pooling their thinking resources. But then the machines began to change. And as they changed, we found that we could not control them. they began to take on a life of their own. And if that gets out of control, we would have essentially a non-biological cancer that could just eat up, you know, the natural world. That's the so-called gray goo problem. This creeping gray goo stripped bare all life, devouring it to create more nanobots. In this future world, your only defense would be to pray that gray goo will not arrive at your door. And while to most it may seem that this world of gray goo is nothing more than science fiction, it all seemed to take a step closer thanks to a discovery by a brilliant young physicist his name was Jan Hendrik Schön. <laughs> Hendrik Schön was one of the greatest minds the world of physics had seen for years. Was he like David Beckham in soccer? Yes. Was he like um, some major rock star? Yes. He could actually go by his first name, Henrik, and we would all know who he was. By the tender age of 31, 
Hendrick had already made breakthroughs in the world of lasers and superconductors. The amazing thing about Hendrick was that everything he touched seemed to work. It blew everybody away. We thought we were pretty good. And, and we just couldn't touch this guy. He was coming up with a brainstorm every few weeks. He seemed to be showing those with far more experience than him how to do science. We all have ideas about experiments, and unfortunately, they never work out as planned. But in his case, they always seem to work out just as planned. What was amazing about Schoen is he got them all to work. You know, five or ten experiments, 20 experiments, all of them incredibly difficult in different areas, and they all worked. And his breakthroughs were reflected by a prolific rate in publishing. At one point, he was producing a paper every eight days. He barely seemed to pause for breath. This was the new level of science that you had to match yourself up against. And everybody knew they couldn't, they couldn't meet that. It was like competing against a god, really. And in December 2000, this scientific god accepted a permanent position at one of the world's greatest research facilities, Bell Laboratories here in the US. It was a dream job. Bell Labs has a reputation for producing Nobel Prize winners. Eleven have won the prize since its founding in 1925. He would now be given the resources to do truly amazing work. And before long, people were whispering that he might be in line for the greatest prize in science himself. I even remember that one day I went to my president telling him, look, you should know that there is a former student of us who is really doing excellent work because, you know, I'm, a, I'm joking a little bit, but anyway, uh, in case he wins the Nobel Prize, I told to my president, you should know before and not reading it in the newspaper. A mere two years after graduating, he was already a legend. And yet, his most daring work was still to come. In the spring of 2001, Shun started the work that would bring him worldwide fame and seemed to draw us a little closer to a new world of nanotechnology. Hendrik Shun had set about trying to solve what some see as the greatest scientific threat to global wealth, the breakdown of Moore's Law. The end of Moore's law is perhaps the single greatest economic threat to modern society. And unless we deal with it, we could be facing economic ruin. Moore's law relates to the one thing that has powered our progress and defined our age. And this is it. This is the silicon chip. Moore's law is the law that governs the silicon chip, one of the greatest triggers of economic progress ever. This tiny element has created a world which at the beginning of the last century would have seemed unimaginable. It has led to growth on an extraordinary scale. Because of the silicon chip, productivity has exponentially increased. My grandfather, for example, was a small farmer. You can